So thanks again, Brother Tom. In this uh, next study, brothers and sisters, we're going to have a look at this latter portion of Genesis chapter 9. And there are some unfortunate things that happen in in this section. But out of this is to come the prophecies of Noah, uh, which are going to have far-reaching implications for the rest of history. As I said, what we're going to find in our studies, and we've already seen indications of this, is that What we have here in Genesis 9 to 11 and the first little part of chapter 12 is the foundation of all Bible prophecy. It's all going to come uh, from this section of Scripture. Now, that may seem like a a total exaggeration to some folk, but it's not going to seem that way, as I said, when we're done. So, what do we read then in verses 18 and 19 of Genesis chapter 9? That the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth. And Ham is the father of Canaan. Now you never want to ignore anything that the scripture says. Why do we get this little fact included at the end of verse 18? And Ham is the father of Canaan. Well, of course, Canaan is the father of the Canaanites. And the Canaanites are going to have a lot to do with the family of Abraham, the nation of Israel. And when Abraham came in the land, what was the first thing that it says about Abraham when he came into the land? He came in the land, and the Canaanite was then in the land. So straight away you get these little hints of what's going to come up in the future. So that's just one thing thrown in there, that Ham uh, is the father of Canaan. They're going to play such an important part in the life of Abraham and his seed uh, for uh, millennia. goes on to say, of course, these are the three sons of Noah, and of of them was the whole earth overspread. So when you look at the table of nations, you see this this reddish sort of colour, brownie reddish sort of colour up here, it's actually red on my screen, Uh, that is where Shem, uh, where Japheth rather, Inhabited. So that those who came from Japheth largely inha- inhabited this area to the north. And we're going to see, of course, just how expansive Japheth was. And then you have, of course, Shem, the Shemites or Semites down here. And then you have the descendants of Ham down here in northern Africa, mainly in northern Africa. But you'll see that they're there in the land of Canaan. So that the, the Canaanites came from Ham. And uh, that, as I said, is going to have... A very significant role to play. Now, all nations are from one. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 26, when Paul is on the Areopagus in Athens, he says in his speech to the Athenians that God hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. And that's been challenged. It's been challenged by people who say, well, but there are various blood types. You know, I'm A and you're B and your or whatever it might be, there are various blood types, so this can't be true, that God is made of one blood. Well, of course, that's, you'd call that pedantic, wouldn't you? Yeah, it is, it's pedantic. But there's an answer to that. There's a simple answer to that. In the Greek, blood is omitted. Uh, is omitted. So you, you don't find that word in the text. It's not there. It's been put in by the translators. The revised version renders it that God hath made of one That is, he made mankind of one, namely, firstly, Adam, and then secondly, Noah. Because, of course, when the entire population of the earth was wiped out by the flood, all peoples came from Noah through his three sons. So he made mankind of one, firstly Adam, then Noah. Weymouth translates it this way. He caused to spring from one forefather people of every race. And that's, of course, proven to be true. But then we come to this record of verse 20. And Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. Now this is the first recorded vineyard in the scripture, and it doesn't produce very good outcomes. Because, of course, Noah becomes a victim of his own husbandry. So that word, he became a husbandman there, actually is two Hebrew words, ish, adama. Now ish means a great man, or a significant man, and adama obviously comes from Adam. 
All right? So if you're going to spell that out, what it really means, a man of the soil, a man where Adam came from. And unfortunately, his behaviour uh, takes him back to Adam, to the nature he bore that he got from Adam, just like you and I have got that nature. A man of the ground, he proves to be, just like we all prove to be, uh, there's only one that was born a son of Adam who didn't prove to be truly a man of the ground. He proved to be the son of God and overcame the problem of sin in its own arena. So sin, sin in this record of Genesis 9, verses 20 to 23, is going to re-enter the scene through the blood of the grape. Now, isn't that interesting? The sin of Noah comes about through the blood of the grape. And in Genesis chapter 9, verse 5, what do we read? That the redemption of mankind is going to come through the blood of every man's brother. Yeah. So tomorrow, we're going to partake of wine. What are we partaking of? The blood of the grape. What does it represent? The shed blood of Christ as the redeemer of mankind. So I think there's a, there's a curiosity there, isn't there? That the, the first recorded sin post-flood is this sin of Noah. So what was it that he did here? So let's explore this. Verse 21. He drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. Now we need to explore what that all means. In the, in the Old Testament, wine, the word wine, has eight different Hebrew words for it. The one we're dealing with here in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 21 is this first one in the box. Yayin means to ferment. It is used of every sort of wine. Now, there are seven others. Tirosh, from the root to possess, that is to possess the brain, because wine can take over the brain, so to speak. Kima, <coughs> to ripen, is used of strong red wine in the Old Testament. Shika, strong drink. Asis, new or sweet wine. <coughs> Sobi, or I don't even know where they got the word sober from, but I, don't, I hope not from that one, because it means to drink to excess. That's not being sober, is it? So I guess that there may be some relationship between the English word sober, because, of course, to be sober means you don't drink to excess. Well, you don't drink at all. Okay? So it means to drink to excess or to become drunk. Mimsak, mixed or spiced wine, and shemarim, old wine. So it's, it's an interesting fact that in the Old Testament there are eight words used of wine. So what should wine really do? What should it speak to us about, brothers and sisters? I think it should speak about a newness of life. And that newness of life that we live in Christ, where does that lead? Doesn't it lead to eternal life? Yeah. What's the number of eternal life? Eight. Yeah. So you see the way that the scripture is so beautifully structure. So here you've got these gentlemen here, this is how they did it in the old days, they brought along the, the grapes from the vineyard they put them into a into a, a repository and then you got in there and you, you stamped it out with your feet and the, the juice ran down into these lower pools and by the time it got down to the bottom one most of the residue had been sifted out of it and then you put it into bottles and then you shipped it from bottle to bottle until it was fermented and you had Beautiful wine, see? Long process. Remember what I said about that? Long process. Yeah. That's why you had to bring a drink offering. Along with your meal offering. When you brought a peace offering or a burnt offering to Yahweh. Tomorrow, you and I will turn up, God willing, and we're going to make, as it were, a peace offering with our God. Because it spoke of fellowship. What do you do when you walk out the door? Well, you've just partaken of what? Bread and wine. How do you get there? With hard work. You see, you see, you come along to be reminded that you've got imputed righteousness, your sins can be forgiven, but you can't walk out that door without doing something about it. You can't walk out that door without the intention of living the things that you have expressed in that meeting. Rededicating yourself to your God. Renewing your covenant. You can't do that, brothers and sisters. You had to bring along a meal and a drink. That's why we partake of bread and wine. Okay, so you see the point of all that? That comes out of this experience of Noah. 
Now the proverb says this. Proverbs 23, verses 29 to 35. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Going to be shown to be true in the family of Noah. Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine. They that go to seek mixed wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth it his colour in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. And it's true, isn't it? History shows that to be true. Now, I can't remember what kind of wine you have here at uh, uh, Tulsa Joplin Ecclesia. We'll find out tomorrow. But very often when I am at different ecclesias, some of the wine that you're given to remember Christ is very nice. You know what really shouldn't be very nice? You know that, brothers and sisters? Now, I'm known to be controversial at times. Let me just enter into this briefly. You know why it really shouldn't be nice wine that we drink? Because, you see, when they killed the Passover and ate the Passover, they had, had to eat it with what? Bitter herbs. So you know what kind of wine my wife and I take away when we're not able to get to a meeting and we have our own memorial meeting? We buy dry wine. Now, you wouldn't drink that in a fit. It's, it's awful. It's bitter. It's, it's, you could spit it out. It's awful. Why do we do that? Well, because, you see, we want to be reminded of the bitterness of the sufferings of Christ. Just like Israel, when they partook of the Passover lamb, they had bitter herbs. It wasn't meant to taste good. All right? It wasn't meant to be pleasant because you were reliving the sufferings of Christ. Got a picture? Now, I'm not saying you should go out and buy another, another bottle of wine for tomorrow. But what I am suggesting is that we need to think a bit more about it. We need to think more about it. And when we do things, do it scripturally. And that's, that's what uh, we need to be doing. Noah, unfortunately, thought that this wine was terrific. You know, this was the best wine ever. So he drank far too much. And when he drank far too much, he suffered the consequences. Just like the proverb says... Thine eyes shall behold strange women. Now, I'm not suggesting he did that, but I'm going to suggest there was a sexual component to what was happening. And thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea. That's pretty unstable. Or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. Really? They have stricken me, shalt thou say. And I was not sick. They have, t they have beaten me, and I felt it not. You know, his past feeling, isn't he? His brain is gone. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. And that's the problem, isn't it? That's an addiction. It can become an addiction. That's why my parents taught us as children, myself and my two siblings, from the very outset, we were taught not to partake of alcohol except to remember the sacrifice of Christ. Now, there's no, I've got no problem with people drinking wine. If they wish to drink wine, that's up to them. But I won't. I won't because I don't want my children or anybody else to say, well, he did it. Dad did it. And if it's good enough for Dad, it's good enough for me. Yeah, that's because on both sides of my family, my mother's side and my father's side, there were absolute disasters because of alcoholism. And that's why my parents did that for us and that's why we did it for our kids. Okay, so we, we accept. We accept that this can happen. It may not happen to everyone, but it can happen. And I'm not going to be responsible for anybody's loss of the kingdom. Okay, that's the principle that we go by. And in, to, in, in today's society in Australia, the most irreligious nation on earth, binge drinking is our big problem. And we've got several brethren who are ambulance officers. They drive ambulances around. And the worst time is Friday night. And Saturday night, when young people go out and binge drink and take drugs and all sorts of things, it's the worst time. We've got a surgeon in Brisbane who says that Sunday night is the worst night of his life because he's got to put back together the faces. He's a, he's a surgeon. He rebuilds people's faces that have been punched in in fights and brawls. 
Right? He spends all Sunday night repairing people's faces because of binge drinking. So it's become a huge problem. And it's one of the sources of the violence that marks the days of Noah. We're in that time of violence, when violence filled the earth. It's a scourge of society today. Okay, so we need to understand. Here's the scripture saying, if it can happen to Noah, it can happen to anyone. Here's the righteous man. Here's the man who built an ark for the saving of his house. And what's he doing? He's out of his brain. And something happens here that's awful. What happens? Well, the effect of intoxication in the, in the days, in, in, in this case of Noah, there are several words used in the Hebrew here for the first time in the Bible, including the word wine. Okay? First time. And there's this word uncovered. Now, galah in the, in the Hebrew, of course, no relationship to the Australian word that we use of people who are idiots. And what we call them? We have a bird in Australia that squawks and makes a lot of noise. And as a pest, they're called galahs. Right? So we call idiots galahs in Australia. And so here we've got Noah uncovered. He was acting like a galah. It means to be uncovered, to reveal oneself. And the verb indicates an action done on one's own behalf. It's like that middle voice in the Greek. Thus, he uncovered himself. Now, look, I'm not going to go into the, into the finer details of the description here, but use your imagination. It's not hard to come up with a picture of what happened here because it has a sexual connotation. And it's consistent with what we've just read in Proverbs 23, verses 29 to 33. This wine had produced a lack of control. It loosens moral grip. And it arouses sexual desire. We saw that from Proverbs 23. You will look upon strange women. Okay, So there's undoubtedly a sexual component to what's happening here. Now, I really shouldn't do this. Uh, and I probably won't get a chance to do this tonight when we talk about signs of the times. But if I can't uh, do it then, I should probably do it now. If you ever look at Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, you'll see that this is how Vladimir Putin came to office as the president of Russia. And have you ever seen, have you ever seen the two-part TV series called The Putin System? Then you have been denying yourself. Okay? You need to get onto YouTube and look at it. The Putin System. I can actually give you a copy of it. It shows you the early years of Vladimir Putin's reign as president of Russia and how he got into power. And Habakkuk chapter 2 describes it because it tells us tells us something that happened. Now, you remember the Yeltsin years, the awful Yeltsin years. Well, Yeltsin's family, his daughter and son-in-law and Yeltsin were ripping off the Kremlin's treasury, $63 million or something they ripped off. And when, when Yevgeny Primakov became the, the, the Prime Minister of Russia in 1998, he decided to investigate the Yeltsin family because he wanted to be the president. He wanted to get rid of Yeltsin and become the president. And so he, he appointed a, an investigator, a man of some standing in the Russian jurisprudence system, an investigator to investigate the Yeltsin family. And he was to report to Parliament. And Yeltsin knew this was coming. He knew that he'd be put in jail. You, can't, you don't get vodka in jail, and he lived on vodka. Okay? And, and he wouldn't live out the, his last years, the last couple of years as president of Russia. And so he rang up the man whom he had just appointed as the head of the FSB. His name was Vladimir Putin. Okay? Who had become a loyal servant of Yeltsin. And so he'd been made the head of the FSB, the KGB as it was called. And Vladimir Putin is alleged to have said, leave it to me boss, I'll handle it. So he arranged for a KGB safe house within, inside the Kremlin walls in which he placed two women of the darker side of the night, I need to say any more, and filled the fridge with strong liquor. And he lured, they lured the prosecutor into that house. And, again, I'm not going to describe what was going on inside that house. He didn't need to describe it because it was actually being played live on Russian television. Yes. So what was going on inside the house was seen on most TV screens in Russia. What was going on? Well, exactly as Habakkuk 2 verses 15 and 16 said. 
Woe unto him that giveth his neighbour drink, that puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken, also that thou mayest look on their nakedness. Thou art filled with shame for glory. Drink thou also, and let thy foreskin be uncovered. The cup of Yahweh's right hand shall be turned unto thee, and shameful spewing shall be on thy glory. Do I need to tell you that that prosecutor went out of that house very, very, uh, uh, with a tail between the legs, uh, resigned from his position, and Yeltsin was saved, and on the 31st of December 1999, Yeltsin handed the leather briefcase to Vladimir Putin and says, and said to him, the presidency is yours, providing, this is the quid pro quo, providing you give me uh, a pension from the Russian Treasury for the rest of my life, a nice dasher to the north of Moscow, uh, and an endless supply of vodka. Well, of course, he died in 2009 of cirrhosis of the liver. Okay. So that's, that's how Vladimir Putin came to power. You know that Habakkuk 2 is about the latter days, don't you? Look at verse 14. Look at verse 20. Verse 14 says, The earth should be filled with the knowledge of the glory of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. When's that? Post-Armageddon. Look at verse 20. But Yahweh is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. What's Habakkuk 3 about? The march of the rainbow angel. The 40 years of divine judgment. This is a latter-day prophecy about the latter-day dictator. Yeah, we got him. Okay? So you've got prophecy being fulfilled in the way that Vladimir Putin actually came to power. And he's using this principle, you know, alcohol to take sexual advantage of another, to expose someone. Well, Noah was exposed in his tent. I'm not going to say too much more about that except to use this word, urva. Come back to Genesis chapter 9. Verse 22. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. Now this word erva means nakedness or nudity, shame or pudenda. In other words, the sexual organs. It's the first occurrence in the Old Testament. It is used throughout Leviticus 18 and 20 of the uncovering of nakedness, which is actually in those contexts a euphemism for sexual relationships. And I think we should actually prove this. Just keep your hand in Genesis 9 and have a look at Luke chap- I'm sorry, Leviticus chapter 20. Leviticus chapter 20. Leviticus 20 verse 11 says this. And the man that lieth with his father's wife hath uncovered his father's nakedness. Notice that. It's a strange way of putting it, isn't it? He's uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. So what does it mean to uncover someone's nakedness? Well, in this case, it's clear, isn't it? It's about sexual relationships between a male and a female. Yeah, improper sexual relationships. So when this word is used, it's got that kind of connotation. It's got something to do with the sex. Now, I'm not suggesting for one moment that there's a woman in, in Noah's uh, uh, abode. Not for one moment. But I am suggesting that what happened was that it had a sexual component to it. Okay? Whatever that may have been. But I'm also going to suggest this. That either Ham or Ham and Canaan, his son, saw it. When Ham comes into that place, he sees it. So he says in verse... In verse 22, and Ham the father... What does it say, the father of Canaan here? Don't you know that already? So why does it say, the father of Canaan? Because Canaan's involved in this. When we come to the prophecy of Noah, it's not Ham that the prophecy is against. You know who it's against? Canaan. So Canaan's going to play a big part in the events that occur uh, in this section. So the use of this word, as we said, implies shameful nakedness rather than simple nudity. For, for which, simple nudity, the word in the Hebrew is erom. And erom is used ten times in the Old Testament. The latter occurs, for example, three times in Genesis chapter 3. So in Genesis 3 verse 7, 10 and 11, we are told that Adam and Eve were both naked. And they were not ashamed. All right? Naked, not ashamed, end of chapter 2. But then they were ashamed. Then, then they had to put covering 
over themselves. Then they took fig leaves in Genesis 3, 7, 10 and 11. And they covered their nakedness. Why? Well, now they were ashamed of it. See. Why were they ashamed of it? Because the brother Thomas says in Elpis Israel, they had come together for the first time under the, under the inflaming of what had been good desires that had now, through the serpent's reasoning, been turned to bad desires. Right? And Cain, he says, Cain was the result of that union between Adam and Eve. Okay? So you see the idea? You've got that word. Who told you that you were naked? See, it's, it's actually about nakedness, simple nakedness. But it's in their case, just like Noah's, it has this little indication that something wasn't quite right. So what happens here? Well, come back to the record of Genesis 9 with me. Ham in verse 22, he goes in, he sees... He sees in the tent the Ohel, so they haven't built houses yet. This can't be too far down the track from the flood, can it? And built houses, they were tents. He sees the nakedness of his of his father Noah. And he goes out and he tells Shem and Japheth. And in verse 23, Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon their shoulders and went backward. Now what were they going to go backward for? Well, because they couldn't see, could they? But they weren't going to see the nakedness of Noah. So they, they know he's in there, so they put the, the garment over their shoulders and they walk backwards through the tent door <coughs> and they, they keep walking until they hit the, whatever it is he was lying on and throw the garment over him. That's what they did. Out of respect for their father. They went backward and covered the nakedness of their father and their faces were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness. So what we have here in this record are different characters in the family of Noah. Isn't it a marvellous thing that you can have several children and they've all got different personalities and different characters, so to speak, but they come from the same parents? It's incredible, isn't it? We had four children, they're all different. They come from the same parents. How did that happen? Well, that happened in the family of Noah. And different attitudes of, of mind. We read about Canaan a little later on. Look at verse 25. He said, Cursed be Canaan. A servant of servants shall, uh, shall he be. So, what about these characters? Well, I'll tell you something, brothers and sisters. They're all types. They encapsulate all types within the ecclesial family. So when we look at this, we can actually see human behaviour. We see it all the time. So what have we got here? We've got Noah. He's upright, but he's subject to weakness and failure, just like you and me. He's the earnest, but weak sinner. He's the righteous man that God spoke about, remember? He's the complete man. But here is a case where he slips and he stumbles. Okay? So we're all like that, aren't we? You can, you can be going along fine and boom! Over you go, because you make a wrong decision. He made a wrong decision to drink too much of his wine, because he enjoyed it. You've got Ham. He's the ungrateful, and, uh, the ungrateful one who's devoid of respect and honour. So he, he represents the arrogant and spiteful sinner. He's actually laughing, really. He's essentially he's laughing about his father's uh, shameful position. Shem, he's sensitive and respectful. He's the godly one here. Now that's interesting, isn't it? Shem, who we think might have been Melchizedek. So, yeah, he's got that honour and respect for his father. This Japheth. Now, you notice what happens here in verse 23. Who is it that, that starts this process? It doesn't say, and Japheth and Shem took a garment. What does it say? It says, Shem and Japheth took a garment. In other words, Shem was the one who suggested it. He was the one who, who said, we've got to do something about this, my brother Japheth. And so they got this garment and walked backwards. So he's, he's, he's dependent, is Japheth, on the leadership of others. He's willing to conform and do what's right, but he does need some leadership. But then you've got Canaan. He's privately base and corrupt, quick to take advantage of other people's weaknesses. Now, you don't think there are people like that in our community then you've not been looking at what happens. I can give you 
a hundred cases off the top of my head where people have taken advantage of the weaknesses of others. Why does that happen in our community? Well, it happens because we've got human nature. And you can't trust human nature as far as you can throw it. Right? You never, ever trust human nature, which is why you never place yourself in a position where you can be tempted to do things that are wrong. Keep away from that. So, for example, how many cases have we had of brethren who have gone out to help a widow or someone whose husband's left her and we've ended up with a disaster on our hands? How many times has that happened when from good intentions very evil things can come? We need to be aware of that. Brother. Don't trust human nature. That's the simple message. So we've got all classes here uh, in the family of Noah. So why is Canaan cursed? Let's just read on, because you see in verse 24, Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. So he's, uh, he's now sort of had time to, you know, and he's, the hangover uh, is, is, is largely over. He's starting to think straight again. And he said, he gives a prophecy in verses 25 to 27. He said, Cursed be Canaan. A servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be Yahweh Elohim of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. So what is the common denominator there? Canaan, that is, the, the son of Ham, is going to have servitude. Now I get myself into, into trouble in this humanistic world by pointing... I said once, for example, that 40 or 50 years ago, Barack Obama would not have been elected the President of the United States of America. You'd think I'd set off an atomic bomb. We've got ex-Christadelphians and humanistic Christadelphians blazing all over Facebook about this, this racist brother from Australia. Okay? It happened 12 months ago, right at this time of the year. Okay. This racist brother from Australia. I've had that, brothers and sisters, several times, but I'm still going to say it. Okay. So if this video gets to where it shouldn't be, then I'll get the same thing again. But I'm going to say it again because it's scriptural. And I don't care what people think. Those who come from Ham, which were the dark races, we're going to become a servant of servants. And it just so happens that history testifies to the fact. And I'm here in this country where you had slavery until 1865. This country proves it. You had slavery. What colour were they? Yellow? No. Black. Where did they come from? Africa. Where did they come from? Ham. Okay? It's as simple as that. And if God said it was going to happen, it's going to happen. I don't care about the humanists. Say what you like about it. But if God says it, it's going to happen. And it did happen. And he said it through Noah. In the prophecy of Noah. Okay? So that, brothers and sisters, that's why we had the situation we had with the dark races who became servants of servants. Cain is cursed because he was almost certainly involved in the transgression with his father. So that Ham went in and saw it. Ham comes out. We don't know whether Ham said to his son, oh, you want to see Grandpa? <laughs> right? And then he goes and has a look. Yeah, he might have done more than have a look. <coughs> Perhaps in the aftermath, when Ham emerged to declare no estate, Canaan got involved. He may have rushed in to look, while Shem and Japheth went away to fetch their covering for Noah. The complete word study of the Old Testament suggests that Canaan may have been involved in some indecent behaviour. So they've gone a step further, haven't they? Some indecent behaviour with Noah before Ham entered the scene. We don't know. Maybe Ham went in looking for Canaan. Maybe Canaan was in there before Ham went in. We don't know. We're not given those details. But what we do know is that Yahweh curses him. 
He doesn't curse him. He curses Canaan. So clearly there was something wrong with the behaviour of Canaan. And mind you, <laughs> here's the major reason. Canaan is the father of the Canaanitish nations who were spewed from the land promised to Abraham for their immorality, their promiscuity, and their depravity in both domestic and religious life. And that's the record of Leviticus 18 and Deuteronomy 12, 29 to 31. Okay? The land spewed them out because of their hideous immoral behaviour. Where did that come from? Well, they had, they had this legacy from Canaan, their forefather. But what about Shem? Well, Shem actually means a name, but not just any name. A name of renown. Shem is the type of Christ here, the name bearer. He shows respect and honour to his father. He provides a covering for a weak sinner, which is exactly what Christ does. He leads others by example. Okay, and we read in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. What's that name? Jesus Christ. Okay. So Shem, who we believe, was Melchizedek. And there are good reasons why the scripture doesn't tell us it was Melchizedek. Very good reasons. But we believe it was Melchizedek. It was an upright man. He's the type of Christ in this prophecy. But you get blessing and cursing here, don't you? You got curse in verse 25, you got blessed in verse 26. So what have we got? In Young's literal, this is what verse 26 says, blessed of Yahweh, my God, is Shem. It's the sixth occurrence of the Hebrew word in the Old Testament, and the word is the seventh, just happens to be in Genesis 12 verse 2. I will bless thee, said Yahweh of Abraham. I will bless thee. Now what does it mean to be blessed, do you think? It, that certainly doesn't mean what the Catholics think it means. You know, if you get a Catholic blessing, they sprinkle holy water on you. Don't they? It doesn't mean that. Well, come and see what it means. In, in Genesis 9.25, curse be Canaan. It's the fifth occurrence of the Hebrew word arah. So the principle established here is that honourable behaviour brings a blessing, while the opposite produces a curse. When you come to Genesis 12 verse 3, the first promise that God makes to Abraham, you read this. It's, I will bless them that bless thee. Now, bless in verse 3 is the eighth occurrence of this word barak. The seventh is in the previous verse, Genesis 12 verse 2. I will bless them that bless thee. And curse, here's our word ara that occurs in Genesis 9.25, I will curse him that curseth thee. This is a different word. This second word, curseth, is a different word. It's kolal. It means to make light of someone. To make them despicable. And hence to curse to make light of someone. Well, what we have here in Genesis 9 is the roots of Genesis 12 verse 3. When you look at what happens, you've got a blessing on this side. Shem and Japheth honoured their father and bestowed the blessing of a covering. And they therefore inherited a blessing. Those who bless Abraham receive the blessing of a covering for sin and ultimate redemption. And that's what Acts 3.26 says, isn't it? When the Apostle Peter, on the day of Pentecost, uh, and beyond, in the speech in Acts 3, uses the Old Testament, one of the passages he quotes in Acts 3.26 is the promise made to Abraham. In thy seed shall all families of the earth be blessed. So what does it mean to be blessed in Abraham? Well, he tells us. Unto you, first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you. So how does Christ bless us? In turning away every one of you from his iniquities. And I'll tell you something. That's a lifetime job. It's a lifetime. 
full-time job. It's the whole process of redemption. So when you read about being blessed in Abraham, it's about what God is doing in your life. When you got baptised, the process began. In my case, it's been going on for 51 years. And I've still got a long way to go. Still got a long way to go. It's a process to turn someone away from their iniquities. Got the idea of that, brothers and sisters? I think I want to be blessed. I don't think I want to be cursed. Because you see, on the other side of the equation, Ham and Canaan made light of Noah's predicament. Right? They made light of it, which is the meaning of the word one, halal. They inherited the curse of servitude. Yeah. Those who make light of Abraham also inherit a curse. And what's that? If you treat the promises that God made to Abraham lightly and turn your back on them, what do you get? You get a curse. And that curse is servitude to sin and ultimate rejection at the judgment seat. That's a real curse. Let's come then finally to Noah's prophecy concerning Japheth. And we read that in verse 27. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. Now Japheth means expansion, enlarged, or widespreading. That's the meaning of this name. So here's the prophecy. How is it fulfilled? Now, Rotherham translates it, God give extension to Japheth, but make his habitation in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be their servant. Well, Noah's prophecy was fulfilled. Japheth is the progenitor of the white races who spread across almost the entire Eurasian continent, which is interesting, because there are only 14 families, much less than the other two sons of Noah. From the national perspective, the colonisation of many far-off lands has fulfilled that prophecy through the white races. From a religious perspective, Christianity claims to dwell now, that is, they dwell in the things that belong to God, now because of, of its origins and its claims of the holy sites. They think they dwell in Shem, in the tents of Shem. Who's Shem representative of? Christ. See. Japheth, from whom Gog comes, will be motivated by the desire to possess the holy sites when they invade the land. So you see how widespread this is? It's got, it's got application across the board. So let's follow this if we can. What does Japheth represent? Well, you've heard about Caucasians. Now, we don't use this term much anymore, do we? Caucasian. But if you go to encyclopedias, like this is Microsoft and Carter, it says this, Caucasian. Term, once used by anthropologists to refer to a racial group consisting primarily of light-skinned peoples of Europe, North Africa, Western Asia and India. The designation Caucasian was first used in the 19th century by scholars who believed that white Europeans originated in Caucasia. So where's Caucasia? Well, it's here, the Caucasus Mountains. Now, they just happen to be a little bit north of the mountains of Ararat, where the ark rested. So Japheth went north. Okay? Uh, my wife's writing to me, isn't that interesting? <laughs> she still loves me. <laughs> so here we've got the origin of Caucasian races. So what about God enlarging the enlarger, Japheth? Well, here we've got, of course, amongst others, we've got the young lions of Tarshish and we've got Donald Trump. Okay? <clears throat> so here's your young lions, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, India, and there's the old lion, Britain. So what happened in history? Well, Japheth inhabited, as you just saw, this entire region of what we would call Eurasia, huge area of the earth. So what happened? Well, they went out from here, didn't they? The Spanish, the French, the British, 
came over here into the North American continent and they inhabited the place. The, the Portuguese, the Spanish, the Italians came down here and they, they uh, inhabited what we would call South America. Okay? Then the British and the Dutch and the French came from the area of Japheth and they inhabited the Indonesian islands, uh, the, the Dutch were there in Indonesia, uh, the, uh, the, the British ended up ruling Australia and New Zealand and the French, uh, Polynesia. Yeah, see, so the Caucasian, the, the, the descendants of Japheth have been enlarged, unbelievably enlarged. They dominate most of the nations on earth. Isn't that amazing? God's prophecies come true. That's, that's amazing, isn't it? I wish most people would believe that. Right? They do come to pass, brothers and sisters. And there's one of them that's come to pass. You begin to see how this is the roots of all prophecy? Yeah. Well, there's more. Just hold on. What does it mean about dwelling in the tents of Shem? Japheth spawned Goma. Who have you heard these names before? Goma, Mago, Madai, which is the Medes, Persians, Javan, the Greeks, Tubal, Meshach, Tagama, and Tarshish. Where have you heard them before? In all of the prophecies that have to do with the invasion by Gog of the land of Israel. Either as part of the confederacy or the opposition to the confederacy of Gog. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, they're all from Japheth. Yeah. The sons of Japheth will initially dwell in the tents of Shem as aggressors. That's why it says in Daniel chapter 11 verse 45, He shall set the tent of his power between the seas in my glorious holy mountain. Where is he? In the tents of Shem. So it's initially as aggressors. But ultimately they will dwell there as worshippers. They will come to worship in this place and share the blessings of Shem, the name bearer in the house of prayer for all nations. Yeah. That's where they're all going to end up, brothers and sisters. And we know that Japheth and Ham will attempt to seize the tents of Shem in the events of Armageddon. Okay? That's how far-reaching this prophecy is of Noah. I'm going to conclude with a verse or two from the Tsarist Anthem. I don't need to tell you that this gentleman down here, standing beside the previous head of the Russian Orthodox Church, sees himself as a Tsar. He has established the vertical of power, the Tsarist style of power in Russia. One man at the top, his word is, is law. You don't want to follow his word, you lose your job or you lose your head. Simple as that. This is verse 3 of the Tsarist anthem, God Save the Tsar. Okay? God Save Orthodox Rus, Russia. First among nations. Make her kingdom harmonious, serene in her strength, and cast out all that is base. Yeah. There's another verse there too, isn't there? God save the Tsar, powerful, sovereign, reign that we may have glory, reign that our enemies are filled with fear. I think there are a few enemies of Russia today that are filled with fear. And there's a few Americans amongst them when they heard that Russia now has an underwater drone that can carry a nuclear missile and can't be defended by anything that America's got. Mm. Got a picture? The far-ranging prophecy of Noah. The roots of all Bible prophecy, brothers and sisters. And we've only seen a fraction of it. You wait. We've only seen a fraction of it. Of what's here in this record of Genesis 9 through 12. But this day is going to come. Do you remember what it said about Noah? You just have a look at verse 21 of Genesis 9. It said this. He drank of the wine and was drunken. And he was uncovered within his tent. You know what the word tent there is? Ohel. O-H-E-L. You know what it means? A round tent. Mm -hmm. 
You know what the house of prayer for all nations is called? In Isaiah 16 verse 15. The O hell of David. And there's one sitting in there who's the name bearer. The Shem bearer. Right, ruling in righteousness and judgment. His name is Jesus Christ. 